um, warm good morning to everybody um, and thank you for participating in this webinar um, or that we are organizing to commemorate the International Day of Families. Um, we are very grateful for everybody who we know is very concerned about COVID and involved in a lot of activities. We are very grateful for your participation and we're looking forward to a very interesting one and a half hour. We have a very um, a prestigious uh, list of, of presenters uh, who will be sharing some information and we will also um, give enough time for uh, questions and answers so you can also ask your questions. Um, let me present myself. My name is Sonia Cafe, and I am the Regional Adolescent Health Advisor at the Pan American Health Organization based at PAHO headquarters in Washington, D.C. And so um, without further ado, um, I will review quickly the agenda with you. Um, first, we will start with an introduction of Dr. Andres de Francisco, who is the uh, director of the Department um, Family Promotion and Life course here at PAHO. Um, then we will move forward to, with a presentation from Dr. Betsy Butron, who is the Regional Child Health Advisor at PAHO. Uh, we are very uh, privileged to also have the participation of the Permanent Secretary of St. Kitts and Nevis, Shalisa martin Clark. And then we move on to, um, to questions and answers and a time of discussion. Uh, before we uh, start with the first presentation, I would like to thank Ados May, who is managing the platform that is from the IBP uh, network and who is, uh, has kindly agreed to help us facilitate this webinar. I will ask Ados to run us through some of the guidance on the use of this platform so you know where to post your questions um, and how to participate. Over to you, Ados. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Sonia. It's a pleasure for me to, to support this, this webinar. Um, and just very quickly, uh, just uh, want to remind everyone in the audience that the webinar will be recorded. Uh, a link will be sent to all participants and those who register and couldn't be with us in this live event. Um, that will uh, be sent out later this afternoon or tomorrow. And um, you can submit any questions or comments uh, throughout the presentation uh, by uh, clicking on the questions box that you see on your control panel. There are a couple of handouts, including the copy of the entire presentation on the handouts uh, session, as well as one of the resources uh, uh, from uh, PAHO WSO. Show. Um, if you have any questions, uh, again, please write them up and we'll be monitoring that as we uh, move forward with, with the presentation. And thank you again. Thank you, Edas. I would now like to invite Dr. Andres de Francisco, Department Director of Family Promotion and Life Course, to make an open introductory remarks. Good morning, colleagues. Um, and welcome to this webinar on family wellness and resilience in the time of COVID-19. The International Day of Families is observed on the 15th of May every year. And this year, more than ever, the families face unprecedented stress during, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It is important for us to celebrate and examine the role families have in supporting our communities and individuals across their life course. I would like to start by providing a bit of a history on this day. During the 1980s, the United Nations began focusing attention on issues related to the family. In 1989, the General Assembly proclaimed the International Year of the Family. And in 1993, the General Assembly decided in a resolution that the 
15th of May every year should be observed as the International Day of Families. This day provides an opportunity to promote awareness of issues related to families and increase the knowledge of the social, economic and demographic processes affecting families. Families around the world are changing. Many are becoming more as the number of single parent households grows. On the other hand, there are indications that the number of families extended with extended members such as grandparents is growing and you know that uh, one of the life that uh, population is actually increasing and those are uh, also very important parts uh, of the family uh, component of the family although families all over the world have transformed greatly over the past decades in terms of the structure and as a result, global trends, the United Nations still recognizes the family as the basic unit. They provide an opportunity to promote awareness of issues to economic and demographic process affecting them. It's one of the most invited units of society. the family has great implications on the health individuals direct role in generating health promoting health issues and encouraging behavior change happens in the home good or bad resonate with the context likewise issues that affect populations affect the family environment and the health of family members with this understanding of the family's influence on health, the family is often referenced in health and development. For example, in the 2030 development agenda, this agenda indicates that the very achievement of many sustainable development goals and targets would benefit from explicit and implicit family policies and programs. The Pan American Health Organization has a strong history in working with families as such. Uh, my department, the department I'm director of, has the word family at the beginning. The family, health promotion, and life course department capturing the essential role of family. Our work with families has many dimensions, ranging from immunizations to child and adolescent health and development, aging, sexual and reproductive health. It is important to note that working with families implies more than working with an individual member of the family. Rather, a family focus approach aims to leverage the added value of the family unit. The focus shifts from the individual to the relationship, to a more holistic and multidimensional approach. It adopts a life course perspective that considers the members of the family in relation to the changing environments and their implications for the process of health generation and development. A family focused approach has four key principles. Family diversity, respecting the diversity of the family life and promoting health equity. Second, family responsibility supporting families in fulfilling their responsibilities. Three, family empowerment, supporting families in using their strengths to identify and meet their needs. And fourth, family stability, supporting family relationship and commitments. And every member of a family has a role to play in fulfilling these four key principles. The COVID 19 pandemic is having a profound impact in all aspects of society including on families it is altering relationships within families and between families as well as the health social and economic status of each one of its members we have been we have seen how this affects us for uh, during the lockdown period 
Despite this unprecedented crisis, the evidence indicates that it is possible to strengthen the capacity of families to adapt to the current circumstances and achieve positive results in the short and long term. It is this capacity for adoption that will be necessary to face the consequences of the epidemic and help in the recovery of our countries. For this reason, our department found it fitting to commemorate International Family Day this year with a special emphasis on resilience of families. During this webinar, you will hear presentations and participating discussions on how we can collectively support and strengthen families to improve their health and wellness in the midst of this crisis. These presentations will have more of a focus on a type of families that have parents, children, babies, but notwithstanding that the composition of the families uh, that we are celebrating can vary. Some don't have children, some have um, older adults and so on. As PAHO, we will continue to promote and support family-focused approaches as an important strategy to promote health equity and to achieve the sustainable development goals for our region. I wish all of you a happy day of the family and hope that you will and your families stay healthy and safe. Before listening to the next presentation, I invite you to watch a brief video from Chiapas, Mexico, as an example of a family-based program PAHO has been supporting for many years in the region. I hope you enjoy it to celebrate this important day. Thank you very much.
Yes. Um, thank you very much, Dr. De Francisco, and I hope you enjoyed the video. It's just uh, it was in Spanish, but it had the uh, English subtitles, and it's just one of the examples of some of the work that PAHO has been doing over the years to help strengthen families for the health and well-being of all the family members uh, individually and the family unit. I will now in, um, invite Dr. Batsabe Butron, uh, the Regional Child Health Advisor, to make a presentation. Uh, Dr. Butron is um, the, I'm so, I'm so sorry, she is from, uh, from Peru, but she has been working for more than 20 years in public health. She's a pediatrician and work, has been working with PAHO for 15 years. Uh, she also worked in PAHO offices in the Caribbean, in, in Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean, among other countries and is currently responsible for the Regional Technical Cooperation on Child Health uh, at PAHO headquarters. Uh, please uh, uh, go ahead, Betsy. Uh, thank you very much, Sonia, and thank you everybody for being here with us. Um, this is a special day for celebration, and hopefully after this uh, seminar, you will be joining us to celebrate families today and every day of the of the year. Uh, the next one, please. Um, talking about families and health is not uh, a new term. It's not a new concept. I'm sure everyone was has um, read these uh, terms and concepts in many documents. And actually, the essential role of families is explicitly recognized in various. Uh, resolutions from the United Nations and it's central to the Convention of the Rights of the Child and it's also part of the constitutions of several countries in this region. In addition to that, several countries have recently defined a new model of care, an updated model of care, which recognizes the role of families and communities as part of their efforts for universal health coverage. The next one, please. Uh, I just want to show you here uh, the, the text of the preamble of the Convention of the Rights, just to learn or remind ourselves uh, how family is central to this document, and it's also central to very other uh, UN documents. In here, in this, uh, the document of the Convention of the Rights, it says that family is the fundamental group of society, and it is the natural environment for the growth and well-being of all its members, and in particularly for children. And I want to emphasize here that um, this concept that it is family is, is central for the well-being and for everybody who is part of that family. Um, and therefore, it says the family should be afforded the necessary protection and assistance so that they can fully assume its responsibilities. So protection and assistance are, assistance are two, those two uh, issues that we should try to think how much our countries are providing protection and how much our countries are providing assistance so that families can as fully assume its responsibilities. And it also says that rec it recognizes um, that a child uh, should grow up in a family because it's central to the full and harmonious development of this child. And, should, and this family environment is, 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 an, is the ideal um, place for happiness, love, and understanding. Those three words that we saw so clearly in the, in the video we just uh, watched. Next one, please. So the concept of family, what is it, what do we mean by family? There is no agreed definition of family, but there is consensus that families are the cornerstone of society. They are essential element for any country development. And family has different functions. And I, here you see some of them. It, it has a reproduction function, 
not only in terms of the biological terms, but also in the reproduction of values, practices, routines, beliefs. It's the place where the next generation socialize. It's also central to early education in those early years, and it's the best complement for any benefit receiving from schooling. It also creates economies of scale for people living together, and it's crucial, it's crucial in promoting solidarity, redistribution of resources among individuals, among households, and even among generations. Families also are the source of protection and insurance against hardship, and they offer identity, love, care, and development to each one of its members. Next one, please. Those are very critical uh, functions. And by reading each one of them, we can see how important it is for the well-being of individuals, communities, and the society as a whole. But families are changing and are changing very quickly and are changing in different ways in different countries. Uh, one of the reasons is the increase in life expectancy, expectancy and the decrease in, in the number of children being born in each country. Uh, families increasingly are living in non-traditional arrangements. Uh, we see more cohabitation, people marrying at older ages, same-sex sex couples, and divorce are also increasing. More and more we see that women and men, those who decide to form a family, are they want to combine career and an active family life. Um, but here we see a challenge because even today, with all these changes, women still spend more time in caregiving, even when they are working. And children have fewer siblings and they live in, um, more often in families um, who are one parent family, blended families, or, fami or parents who are cohabitating. And we also see that babies are spending increasing amount of time in daycare and or similar arrangements. Um, one important issue to take into account is that in this region, in poverty and extreme poverty are increasing among families with children and young people. And here I'm showing you the data, uh, ECLAC data, uh, each column is a year from 2014 and 2015. And, and the first group of columns, you can see that poverty is increasing among those between zero and 14 years, and it's also increasing among the 15 and 24 years. So for in this region, uh, those who are the future of, of societies, of the countries, uh, are not getting better. In terms, in terms of poverty. Um, they are increasingly living in families with poverty or even extreme poverty. Uh, next one, please. So what is the difference between what we are doing now and this now and the family health approach? Currently, we are mainly focused on individual members. Some work with children, others with adolescents, others with mothers, others with men, uh, or sometimes women are receiving our services, but not taking into account that these same women uh, is also a mother or a grandmother. So we have this individual approach uh, in, in the way we provide services and the way we uh, design our policies and programs. And, they, and by doing this, we are uh, paying more attention to the clinical and biological causes of ill health. And, uh, and in this way, we fail to recognize that others may or may not offer protection and support to maintain health or to recover from disease. Having a family health approach strengthens the family functions, those functions that we discussed earlier. Consider relationships, interactions as, as, as the source of protection, resilience, and when those relationships and interactions are negative, it's also a source of risks. 
And when, by mean relations and interaction is what you just saw in that video. It's communication, it's sharing ideas, sharing feelings, sharing affection, uh, sharing doubt, sharing fear as well, and finding solutions together. <clears throat> Having a family health approach builds on their diversity, their strength, and what, by working to, together with families, we try, try to address the sources of adversity. When we have a family health approach, we, the benefits are for most members. It's not only for one, it's for more than one. And by doing this, we have a more holistic and multidimensional thinking. Next one, please. Some examples here. Here we have the policies to ensure work and family balance. These policies are a good example of a family health approach. Uh, the paid parental leave or the benefits that some countries provide to new moms and dads, the subsidies for childcare or the policies for breastfeeding or breastfeeding in workplaces. All of these are good examples where the benefits is not only for the woman or for, or for the dad or for the child, it's for all of them. And, uh, and it's, it's thinking not only in, in the current situation, and it's the benefits will be not only on, uh, in the short term, but also the medium term and the long term. Another examples are the parenting programs for teen parents, single parents, parents with teens or young children. This, an example of this is the uh, Familia Fortis the video that you just, that you just watched. Um, in this, again, the parenting programs are targeting parents and children, um, but, but the intention, the objective the, is to benefit both, not only now, but in the future. Another example are the social programs targeting vulnerable families where they provide job trading, they help families to have a good budgeting, uh, good use of their money, or organize their family routines, or provide psychological, psychosocial support. Another example is urban design, where we create municipalities or local authorities create family-friendly spaces where people of all ages can interact uh, and, and by doing this, we start creating and supporting uh, the building of social capital. Another example is intergenerational programs where a child and older people get together. Like for example, in Chile, they have these very nice programs where older people go to daycare centers or, or uh, preschool centers and they talk to children about their traditions how was their life when they were children and um, um and it is and the benefits are also are for both for children and for the older people other examples are where uh, adolescent and child and children work together or adolescent and older people work together uh, another example could be the integration of parenting interventions in healthcare settings family friendly policies on neonatal units hospitals that allow siblings to visit their newborn baby, uh, even in the ITU unit, or services, neonatal services promoting fathers to do kangaroo, kangaroo care, and also the programs for fathers and boys. Next one, please. The effects of the pandemic on families has been enormous. The life of every family has been disrupted in so many ways. Due to the measures, the physical distancing, the closure of the schools and workplaces, but also for, uh, because of the magnitude or the severity of this epidemic, the rapid spread, the rapid losses of lives, and the uncertainty and the so many unknowns of these epidemics. So each one of us are, are witnesses, many effects, negative effects in, in parents and children and adolescents and every member of their families. Caregivers are having multiple demands. They have to work at home or they have to go outside and try to uh, find money uh, because they don't have a, 
uh, um, a job anymore. Um, and more and more uh, data are coming out uh, showing that parents are increasingly showing anxiety, a sense of loneliness and distress. And the same is happening with children and adolescents uh, because their routines, their social interaction has been disrupted. In addition to that, we, <clears throat> we have health and social services that are closed or very much limited. Uh, we already have uh, reports from countries uh, showing that the violence against women and against children is increasing and um, abuse of children and adolescents through the social media, through internet, is also increasing. Some families are already having problems with food security, and the schools the schools are closed. Um, and because of that, some children are losing the food that they used to receive uh, through the school feeding programs, but they also are losing um, uh, the support and protection uh, and uh, that they, some of them receive uh, by going to schools. The next one, please. So in this uh, situation, uh, it, is, it is critical for us to think about those families who are most vulnerable and join our, our efforts uh, from government, civil society, uh, faith-based organizations, uh, private sector, communities, local organizations, and put our efforts together to build, to support the building of resilience in every family. We need that more than ever. And by, by uh, talking about resilience, I mean that ability to overcome serious hardship, um, like the ones uh, we see now due to the pandemic. And despite of that, those problems, those adversities, we are able to achieve positive outcomes. So uh, we can think about resilience, about the final balance between adversity and protective factors. Uh, the pandemic has put a lot on the adversity side, anxiety, isolation, loss of income, a lot of, a lot of problems. But we can work together and put a lot more on the protective factors. We can advise parents on how to deal with children, how to cope with the stress of having children, more work, more, um, um, more, um, uh, more time being in one space together. We can connect with them, identifying who is in more need and connect with them by email, cell, any, any way you can and provide sources of support. We can mobilize sources of faith and hope. And this is critical. We are listening every day, so many negative news, but there is also a lot of good news, solidarity in the communities between families. Uh, and we have to highlight those examples as well. Uh, it is critical to meet the basic needs of, of, of parents and children. Um, um, especially when they have small children. Food is critical. There's nothing more, uh, uh, there is no higher source of distress for any parent than having a hungry child and building a sense of self-service control. These are just uh, examples of, um, of uh, interventions. Some of them have proven um, um, are proven uh, using di uh, different kind of the studies. But I'm sure in each community, you can pull your resources, your knowledge, and put more on these protective factors. And by doing that, we are going to help countries to build that resilience that they need to overcome this acute period, but also for, for the next one. Because this epidemic, is, this virus is gonna be with us for a long time. And uh, we need not only to overcome the acute crisis, but also to recover. Um, and placing attention, thinking about families and how we build resilience on these families is critical. Um, next one, please.
just uh, to give you a, a, um, um, to finalize some list of resources that we, you will receive uh, with this presentation, and I hope you will find them informative and helpful for you to uh, strengthen the work that you are already doing with families, your own families, the families of those of everybody in your community, uh, and join us and celebrate the importance and the critical role of families every day of the year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Butron. And um, uh, I think Eros mentioned it in the beginning that all these PowerPoints will be shared with you, so you will be able to, um, to access these materials. And we also have some other handouts. I just wanted to say we have some uh, friends, some colleagues uh, who are um, Spanish speaking. Uh, we will have Vamos a tener este seminario en español a las 12. Entonces, ahora es, uh, estamos presentando en inglés. So, if you are, um, you could join later. I also just wanted to, um, to read some of the comments that we are receiving um, because this is a, an interaction. Uh, Mohammed uh, noted that the provision of comprehensive and client tailored service packages which include medical, mental, nutritional, environmental health, will help the families move toward better health in all dimensions, uh, which I think is uh, very uh, related to what Dr. Butron was presenting. We also are taking note of your questions, and they, as, uh, in the questions and answer se section, we will be getting to those. Um, there was also a comment uh, uh, from um, also from Mohammed saying the role of the mother is very important and maybe in the question and answer and discussion uh, time the panel wants to also respond to that. So thank you very much um, um, and without um, further ado I have the privilege to introduce the permanent secretary of St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, Ms. Shalisa Martin-Clark who is a uh, an MPH, uh, has an MPH and a bachelor's degree in health services administration and management and a graduate certificate in global health and has been working for 23 years in the Ministry of Health in various capacities. This is very important for us and we thank you for being with us because as uh, Betsy has presented, working with, uh, with families, strengthening families really requires a multi-sectoral and a targeted approach. And of course, we don't want to wait to work with families when there's a crisis. We want to strengthen families so they are better able to, to deal with crisis. And so uh, from um, um, Shalisa, we can hear from a country perspective, uh, some of the challenges and opportunities to strengthen family in the context of COVID-19. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Shalisa martin Clark, Permanent Secretary acting in the Ministry of Health and Gender Affairs here in Nevis. I wish to thank the PAHO team for extending this invitation and for allowing me to share some of the family experiences as we see today in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Next slide. Just to provide some background information, the population of St. Kitts and Nevis is close 50,000 with about 7% of the population in the age range zero to five and 11% in the age range of 60 and over. Our first confirmed case of COVID-19 was announced on the 25th of March, 2020. It was an, an imported case. And shortly after that, the total number of confirmed positive cases rose to 15, 11 in St. Kitts and four in Nevis. To date, 14 have recovered with no recorded deaths. <laughs> the, the announcement of the first case triggered a series of events such as early closure of schools and daycares, the closure of the borders, closure of workplaces such as hotels, restaurants, and other businesses. Now, bear in mind, tourism is our country's major industry, 
and source of foreign revenue. And the hospitality industry embodies a large portion of the workforce. Furthermore, a state of emergency was also implemented, which sought to restrict the movement of people, not only between the two islands, but also from their homes. We recognize that the family is an important part of our communities. And as Dr. Bertram said, they are the cornerstone of society. But believe it or not, all of these events had some sort of effect on families here in St. Kitts and Nevis, and I'm sure throughout the region. Next slide, please. So some of the challenges that we saw here include the financial hardship as a result of family members being laid off or placed on reduced work hours. And this is especially true for those vulnerable families in our society who live basically from paycheck to paycheck. With little or no income, they have reduced spending power. They can't meet their loan commitments. They can't pay their utilities. And in some cases, can't even buy food. Working as part of the COVID response team, I have seen times where social services department and other members of society had to step in to assist some families with care packages or food vouchers. The government also was able to put in place a COVID-19 relief fund through social security to assist persons who were laid off. And this finance was able to support them during this, their time of on being unemployed and unable to work. Then there is the mental health aspect of dealing with the stress and the anxiety of all that is happening around them. Parents are wondering when they will be able to go back to work and how they're going to pay their bills. Children trying to deal with being stuck at home and the disappointment of not seeing their friends and having that usual social interaction. Some persons became stressed, depressed, because of all of this uncertainty. And not to mention, we also have to consider the health and mental well-being of those persons who were confirmed positive with COVID-19. <clears throat> Nutrition was also a concern. Some persons were having too much to eat, while others were having too little as a result of not having money to buy. While shopping in the supermarket one day, I was amazed. I saw shopping carts full of empty calorie, sugary, and salty food, such as ice cream, chips, biscuits, you name it. But some people consider them to be comfort food during the lockdown. But what good are these food to their diet or their health and well being? Some persons would have reported that. They have gained weight since this COVID pandemic. Also, for some, some, for some families, um, there was a reduction in their physical activities or playtime, especially for those who utilize the gym or outdoor spaces, such as parks and playgrounds to exercise. And to make matters worse, the beaches were off limit. Next slide, please. And I'm assuming, this is just an assumption, that the latter two may have had, may have also contributed to some aspect of hospitalization of family members with chronic non-communicable diseases. Our medical chief of staff would have indicated that there were quite a few admissions to the medical ward since the state of emergency. But I must say that in spite of all of this and the lockdowns and the curfews, all of our public health facilities remained open. The health centers were open during the relaxed curfew days from eight to four. And then during the period of 24 hour lockdown, they were open from eight to about 12. So persons still had access to the basic health services, both at the hospital and the health centers. 
<clears throat> some families experience challenges in having someone to care or supervise their children as schools and daycares were closed and some parents still had to work. Not only that, some are having a challenge of keeping their children entertained and engaged, especially those vulnerable families that don't have access to cable TV, computer and the internet. Some parents, some parents thought that the children were driving them mad. They would say things like, they're eating down the house, they're too noisy and distracting, I can't work from home. We also had increased cases of domestic violence reported to the COVID hotline. This was more so in St. Kitts and it was highlighted in the, the daily briefs. Maybe due to the fact that in some families, the victim and the abuser are confined to the same space as a result of the state of emergency and this sort of exacerbated the situation. I can recall that one murder was reported in the news in Sinkit as a result of domestic violence during this period of time as well. So yes, another thing, COVID brought a big change to our social norms. And this can be seen in the restrictions on social gatherings such as funerals, parties, weddings. And as Caribbean people and families, we like to socialize, we like to party, but now persons have to get accustomed to the concept of practicing social distancing and wearing and the wearing of masks in public. Next slide, please. On the other hand, COVID-19 provided some golden opportunities for families as well. Opportunities such as a chance to spend quality time with the family and children, and this helped in some instance to improve parent and children relationship. Parents have the opportunity to play games, read stories, cook and have meals together. Many families didn't have or made time to do this before as a result of their busy work schedule or commitment. There was also the opportunity to complete some of the long overdue tasks or projects at home, such as paint, such as painting the house, starting the backyard garden. And interestingly enough, the Department of Agriculture was providing seeds and seedlings to families to start this initiative. So as Dr. Bertram would have mentioned, it was a multi-sectorial approach. We see where education came in, we see where agriculture came in, we see where social services came in to help families during this difficult time. And I am sure many housewives are quite happy as they are now able to get their spouse or partners to finish some of the job that they had on pause for such a long time. It also fostered a platform for remote learning and working from home. Many schools are now coming on board using online platforms such as Flow Study, Google Classroom to continue student education. And many businesses, including government, are encouraging employees to work from home. Some family members now have the opportunity to learn new skills such, such as um, making use of technology to continue their education, to attend <laughs> business meetings, attending church services online and so on. So using Zoom for meetings and going to, and go to webinars are now the new norm for some parents and children. There was also the creation of small cottage industries or small businesses. Here in Nevis, there are at least three young ladies who I know who have started small enterprises making masks for sale to, to businesses and the general public. And it was a family approach. Other family members help out where they can in terms of the production line. And this provided a new source of income for the family to augment what they already had. We also saw the creation 
of new product line. For example, some of the rum distillers and the pharmacies move now to produce to, to producing alcohol-based hand sanitizers. And this also helps to provide a new source of income as well as new jobs for family members. Next slide, please. So all in all, COVID-19 has impacted everyone, every family, whether positively or negatively, but it has also created a new norm. And it also demonstrated how resilient families are in time of crisis. So we continue to support and celebrate our families here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, in spite of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. That's it for me for now. Thank you very much, Permanent Secretary. A, a very uh, clear um, il illustration of how really COVID-19 has impacted uh, the communities and the families. Um, and so we we really we assume that this will be very similar for other uh, countries and other communities uh, in the Caribbean and beyond um, of those who are listening in to this webinar. So thank you very much. Uh, I think the presentations all illustrated the importance of a holistic emergency response. Um, very often in the emergency response, we may be focusing on um on on saving lives which is critical obviously um of taking care of the sick the, the sick which is critical uh but how can we make sure that we also bring um a, a caring perspective to uh supporting families to get through this uh, not only to prevent um covid infection but also to make sure that they get through this um this epidemic, which can take uh, quite a long time, get through it in the best way possible um, um, in, in the context of their families. So um, we will now go through to the discussion. Uh, we already received quite a few questions. Um, so what I will do is I will read some of those questions and ask uh, one panel member to respond, Well, uh, but if, the other members of uh, uh, presenters feel you have a contribution to make then then feel free i think uh, ados will now open the microphones of all the presenters so you are able to also contribute um the i will uh, start with a question from dr schenker inon schenker who said how could paho support families maybe dr the francisco and betsy want to start off how could PAHO support families in enhancing functional abilities of their older persons? That's one question. And the second question is, are there guidelines on intergenerational actions? Please go ahead. Thank you very much, um, uh, Sonia. And thank you very much also to thank the presenters uh, that came after my, my introduction. Fantastic. Um, presentations uh, opening a lot of the of the wide spectrum of issues that uh, that arise under discussion uh, specifically on uh, um, Dr. Henkel's uh, question um, how can we enable functional abilities of persons this is an area of work that has been uh, strengthened uh, very much uh, in particular in, in in our department um but uh, as a whole first of all in terms of <clears throat> talking about the uh, health for all and leaving no one behind that includes um people that have uh, these capacities and um we are we have a program that focuses on aging populations that is looking at the way that um that a society as a whole uh, works with uh, with with aging populations um the question um, is not so much how to uh, decrease the dependency um, the question is how to strengthen the functionality of the individual uh, and that includes 
um, identification of um, uh, signs and symptoms that normally the individual doesn't actually um, realize uh, that are actually decreasing the functionality of the of the body um, exercises very simple exercises that you can consult in our in our, in our website to um, to look at uh, how you are losing mass muscle um, uh, mass and strength for the various uh, functions that are being uh, uh, undertaken. So uh, this is being done. Is also uh, we are also providing guidelines for care uh, of uh, aging populations and um, also providing guidelines on what to do in places uh, where uh, older populations are uh, or the individuals are are being um, uh, hosted. As you know, COVID-19 uh, has a predilection for uh, older people for uh, for mortality, and uh, we are working um, we are working on that and have some guidelines. Over from my side, maybe Betsy. Maybe Betsy could address the question on if there are uh, if there is a curricula to engage families. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. No, uh, there is no uh, actually a curricular or guideline on these kind of uh, uh, interventions, but you give us a good suggestion to start working on this. Um, what we know is that uh, some countries have uh, um, already um, experiences with different combinations of different age groups. Um, and some of them have already um, accumulated uh, uh, what a, uh, information on the positive effects as well as the challenges of um, making it happen. So um, I think it would be important for PAHO to maybe collect those experiences and try to learn from those. Um, I, I just want to add to the previous question that um, one of the lessons that this pandemic is teaching us is that we really have to rethink how we care to each other, and especially how we care our uh, older persons, our seniors. Um, uh, we see how the pandemic is, is being more prevalent in senior centers, uh, and we wonder why are so many seniors living alone? Um, when we know already that most of them would prefer to live independently with families or alone in an independent settings. So I think we, um, after the crisis is passed, I think there is an opportunity for all of us to rethink how we care to each other, where are our priorities in social investment, um, and and. It is it's an opportunity for everyone was for every country to come out of this pandemic with a new understanding of where the priorities are and how to invest to recover from the pandemic and for the future. Over to you, Sonia. Thank you. Um, another question is, uh, maybe I should take that question. Uh, the question is, how can PAHO support girls, um, thinking about girls, their rights, et cetera, um, in the in the area, and uh, I will speak about adolescent girls. Maybe Betsy can speak a little bit more about uh, younger girls. Uh, in our program, what we are trying to do when we are developing adolescent health uh, uh, responses is to ensure that there is a gender-based approach, meaning that. Um, in every analysis, it's important to document the vulnerabilities of girls, because you are right, the person who asked this question, that girls face different uh, uh, vulnerabilities than boys. And so in, even in the Strong Families program that, we, uh, that you saw in the video, uh, we try to challenge parents to see the differences, the different needs of boys and the different needs of girls, and to address those. Um, be it related to sexual reproductive health, to mental health and other areas. And so making sure that there's always this gender 
a, di a dimension to our response as we are trying to um, to to make sure that girls are also supported. Uh, there's also a publication from PAHU Empowering Girls where we uh, we can share that document as well that speaks about um, um, how systematically girls often are being marginalized in families, in society, in schools, and the importance of ensuring that we uh, fully empower girls to be part of uh, society. Um, the Another question that was asked, and maybe uh, Betsy and uh, the permanent secretary can respond to that. It, uh, it, there are several questions that speak about uh, the importance of mental health and um, helping families grieve if there is has been a loss <clears throat> of a family member. Um, so maybe um, the two of you can respond to that. How are what are we doing and what can we recommend when it comes to mental health and grieving? Um, uh, permanent secretary you want to start first okay sorry um could you repeat the question again sorry uh there's there's a, uh, i'm summarizing several questions that relate to um how we can make sure that we protect the mental health of family members and one specific item that was asked relates to grieving uh in families that have lost a member due to COVID 19. Okay, well, fortunately, St. Kitts and Nevis didn't have any deaths as a result of COVID-19. But in saying that, regardless of the situation, any death, it's something that most families have a hard time to deal with. The Ministry of Health have in place, um, we have a mental health unit and on the social services as well there's a counseling unit and we often make use of those two units to assist persons in the communities who might have challenges or difficulties when it comes to losing a loved one so those services are in place for persons who might require those services and of course they have the private practitioners as well Thank you. Uh, Betsy or Dr. De Francisco, you want to add something on that? Uh, yes, Sonia, thank you. I think this uh, uh, pandemic is, um, is disrupting our lives in so many dimensions, in so many ways that we are all grieving in some way or another. But those who, are, who have lost an, a family member, are the ones where our efforts should be focused on. And uh, I'm going to add to the resources the link to a very uh, a, a short a brief giving guidance on how to talk to a child when a parent or a family member has died due to COVID, or it could be useful for any other uh, for communicating with children when a death for other courses happening. Um, but basically, um, uh, what, what we need is to, to talk, to first of all, calm ourselves and get ready for that conversation. It's a difficult conversation, but especially difficult when we have to, to talk to our children, uh, to children, uh, take into account what is the age of the child and, and be honest and be frank. And, um, and always after you um, announce the event, uh, make sure that you end up the conversation with support, with reassuring that the child feelings are okay and, uh, and, and reassuring the child that you will be there with the child, supporting that child. There is some, um, clear recommendations uh, that you will find in these documents, but, I, but it, it is something that we, we never thought before. And it's something, it should be part of every social and health services uh, from now on. 
Over to you, Sonia. Thank you. Um, the, there was one question. Can we uh, uh, um, comment on what we are doing to engage young people from Dr. Wheeler? Thank you, Dr. Wheeler. Uh, to keep youth engaged in the Caribbean, um, and especially linked to the, the Congress we had last year in October on um, the health and wellness of young people in the Caribbean. Uh, following the Congress, which really had a very good participation of young people, uh, we have maintained a list uh, uh, of, uh, of the young people and we have regular meetings with them, virtual meetings with the young people. And actually, uh, this is a very good that you mentioned this because I can announce that as of next week, we will have weekly, uh, what we call hangouts with young people uh, on COVID. Uh, it's gonna be every uh, Wednesday afternoon. Um, and young people from the Caribbean will be one hour in English, led by young people, and one hour in Spanish. And the young people will also invite experts to talk about topics. But it's basically a hangout where young people can, can articulate their, their concerns, ask their questions without feeling embarrassed, um, and, and get tips from their peers on how to deal with the self um, the, the, the confinement measures and the fear and the anxiety, etc. So we will share the details on that event as well. Um, you will notice that following the, the webinar, we will be sending you uh, all the materials that we mentioned. Um, I also want to mention that uh, all the things that we are mentioning uh, during the response to questions, we will add links and we will add uh, materials so you can keep uh, the learning and dissemination process. Another question uh, was, how can we integrate our MNCAH programs, which means reproductive maternal neonatal child and adolescent health programs with family health programs? What are the pros and the cons? Um, I don't know if uh, Dr. Uh, De Francisco or Betsy, do you want to start off the, the response to that? How can we integrate family in RMNCAH programs? Um, thank you very much for this question. Uh, let me let me start and I pass it on. Um, I think it's it's a it's a, it's a very important uh, question. I think the 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 video itself of the experience in Mexico show how essential it is um, the communication. Uh, specifically the communication about things that uh, kids and young uh, adolescents um, do not understand changes in their body, changes, hormonal changes and, and others. And as it was stated, uh, we have to talk to, to young people uh, about the, the, the development, the, the physical development and, um, and about what uh, these things uh, mean um, it's, it's it's very important to uh, have an approach in the family uh, in which uh, adults will be able to have these discussions uh, with a, with with a young people uh, in order to make sure that they, you are giving the information that they need to be empowered to take the, the right decisions and avoid um, uh, risk factors. Um, so um, this is this is an important element of um, of, of this discussion. I would just uh, uh, perhaps also like to link this to a question that was done that, that was made before um, that we didn't come back to, which is um, as, as I understand it was something more related to to uh, to mothers themselves, um, and I think that it's very important to understand that uh, moms, mothers are, um, are women. Yeah, they have their own needs uh, that are not exclusively related to looking after kids, and um, that they um, need also um, in terms of health services and health attention. Uh, that it should not be specifically or exclusively 
limited to sexual and reproductive health and, um, and, and, and all of these issues, in particular uh, um, across the life course. Over. Thank you. Uh, there's another question. What is the experience of family-focused approaches globally? What is the evidence? Uh, I will start that off and then I will also ask Betsy to maybe comment on that. Uh, the Strengthening Families program, uh, maybe I start with this first. It's very important if we, when we implement interventions to make sure that they are evidence-based right because if we have programs that may be fun and nice but they are not evidence-based then we're losing everybody's time um the family uh, strengthening program that pahu has been supporting for many years uh, is an evidence-based program as you saw in the video it was uh, first developed in the 90s by um, iowa state university in the u.s and while it started as a a, a u.s oriented program it gradually um, grew and is now um, implemented in different uh, places in the world we chose this program and when i say we this was before my time but paho chose this program based on the evidence of many many years of of uh, strong research results that it does not only uh, impact on families and on individual members, especially on young people in the short term, but in the long term. Uh, some of these studies measured um, effects after five years, after 10 years. Uh, and so it has very strong evidence that it works to reduce risk factors and to improve wellness and positive development. This is why PAHO chose that program. There are not many programs that have strong evidence, uh, but there is, for those that are sound and are implemented right, there is the evidence that family-focused approaches do work. I will ask Betsy, perhaps you want to speak a little bit about some of the other programs we have been looking at um, to perhaps also adopt and promote as PAHO. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the, for the question. Uh, the, the, the evidence is there in many um, um, of the examples that you saw the, um, in one of the slides, uh, I show different ways how policies and programs uh, reflect a family health approach. And, uh, and the evidence is there for most of them. Uh, and for some of them, we have very strong um, evidence about their effectiveness and their positive effects on specific outcomes. Parenting program, this is one of them. Uh, there are several, some of them ha have uh, very strong evidence, as Sonia mentioned. Um, but we also have evidence supporting the, the positive effects of policies that uh, ensure work family balance, uh, the paid parental leave, the childcare subsidy, and of course, the policies on breastfeeding in workplaces. So um, uh, we also have evidence about uh, some of the intergenerational programs. Uh, for example, the, those that have older people and children working together, um, either in schools or daycare centers or in community-based programs, um, the benefits for the older person in terms of mental health, in terms of different aspects of functionality is also there. Um, so, and I can mention many other policies and programs. So it's, it's really a matter of thinking. It's, it's uh, about um, families as a unit, families as a dynamic unit with different, different members and families with their own strengths uh, and their capacity to, to achieve their goals and to overcome adversity. Uh, it's, it's the way we look at uh, individuals that have to change. Uh, individuals are, are not in isolation. They are part of a family and part of a community. It's our way to look at them that needs a, a little bit of change. Uh, but the evidence is there. We have to do it depending on where you are. You are in the health sector, education, the policy decision, 
uh, making um, a level or you are an authority or you are a, a civil society organization, uh, you can find uh, the, the spaces where you can promote this family health approach, um, depending on your uh, mandates and responsibilities. But there, there are many ways how we can do it, from the legal normative environment, from services, from working with families themselves. Over to you. Uh, yes, Sorry. thank you, Betsy. I think we are nearing the end, so we will do one final question. Um, and I think this is a very important question. I will ask Permanent Secretary to start off the response since you work with government. The question is, how do we advocate with governments to support families during COVID-19? And I think it is a really important question because we do understand that governments are very much involved and maybe even overwhelmed with uh, very critical questions such as uh, testing. How do we make sure that there's enough diagnostic capacity? How do we make sure there's enough hospital capacity, etc.? cetera? Um, how do we save lives? And so there's a lot of competing priorities. And the question is, how do we then advocate with governments to support families during COVID-19? Um, go ahead, uh, Permanent Secretary, and then I will ask Dr. De Francisco to also respond. Okay, thank you. Now, since COVID, I know quite a few nations would have had challenges in terms of their resources. How do they deploy their resources, their limited resources? And we here in St. Kitts and Nevis are no different in the sense and the fact that, as I would have mentioned before, that our main industry is the tourism industry. and since the closure of our borders, that has put a great strain on the resources that we have in country, financial resources. What government would have done to assist families, seeing that most of most persons would have been employed in the hospitality industry, is that the social security fund, they would have created a special fund for persons to apply and get access to some financial resources to assist their family during this difficult time. Not only that, government would have made available to families because food security was also an issue in most Caribbean islands because persons were concerned about the fact that they may not get sufficient food supplies coming in through the ports or borders. But that wasn't really a case here in St. Kitts and Nevis. The border was still open for um, those type of um, commercial traffic. So tropical still came through, the containers still came through for, for the, the supermarkets. But government has been impressing on individuals and families to consider backyard farming. We depend too much on imported food. And I would say since the COVID pandemic, we would have seen more and more families gravitating towards the concept of backyard gardening. And through the partnership with the Ministry and Department of Agriculture, families were given seeds, seedlings, um, the agricultural department would have made available their tractors to plow the land as well. And in terms of health care, well, we all know that government is the sole provider of health care here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Most of the doctors who work here work for the government, even though they might have their private practices. And so, we will have had those services available to the population in spite of all that's going on around us. Government still made that available. And sorry to say this, but in some countries, and I would say definitely here in St. Kitts and Nevis, some of the times we feel that the Ministry of Health, we feel that we are a step child. I'm sorry to say that. But since COVID, health was given the forefront. So it was an opportunity for us to 
improve on, on, on some of the services that we offer. It was an opportunity for us to procure some of the equipment and the machines that we needed to provide the services here for the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. So I will leave it at that for now, and I guess somebody else can join in. Thank you. Francisco? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, and I, I I concur with what was said. What what we what what uh, what we are doing uh, is um, we are basically advocating with the uh, ministries of health um, about the importance um, advocating the role of the family in programs that we are um, discussing within the uh, platforms like the Directive Council, which is when ministers come together. And while it is true that um, we do, uh, or the, the, the countries are uh, requesting us to work on specific areas and elements, um, we do, for example, we do actually uh, in, in incorporate discussions on how uh, essential elements of the families can help and how the health, the, the health services can be um, somehow uh, modified to ensure that the, the, that there is an incorporation of families. So, for example, in immunization programs, what, what we encourage is that uh, it's not only the child that gets vaccinated, uh, but also the mother or the father or the other siblings who are coming to the vaccination uh, points. During the discussions on the health of women, children, and adolescents, we also looked at these things like spaces where health uh, can be promoted, health promotion can be given, and working with other uh, sectors such as uh, schools, schools not only healthy schools but schools for health that uh, expands to actions to the families and the in the communities. So uh, through the lens of health we are able to 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 do this and uh, also talk about multi-sectorialism issues of social services across the board thank you thank you very much um and um, i maybe just add a few words is that often when we speak about a, fam a family focused approach and working supporting families it doesn't necessarily have to mean a whole new area of work it's a different way of of looking at the same uh, support that is provided and maybe even making it more efficient um, through a family uh, oriented a family focused approach and so i think the advocacy uh, needs to be based on evidence and it needs to be based on very practical sound recommendations that are implementable that are doable um, so um, i'm not going to try to summarize all of this i think maybe some key points are that uh, we all recognize the importance of the family um, and its role when it comes to the health and well-being of all its members collectively and individually and that by maximizing this role of the family we can contribute to improving the health and well-being of, of all um, in a more efficient way and in a more holistic way. And in the context of COVID-19, this need is more uh, urgent than ever because of the added challenges, the added uh, 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 say problems generated by the COVID uh, epidemic and its response and so within the COVID response it's also important to consider this element of families how do we support families and also how do we use the family dynamic to um, to to uh, advance with prevention and healing and recovery because that's going to be a long path forward uh, so thank you to the presenters and the participants for your participation. Uh, we will be sending all the materials because of your registration, your email addresses are in the system, and we will be sending the presentations and all the materials that we promise we will send to you. And we again wish you a very happy day of the family, and we wish you safe and health safety and health for each and every one of you.
and have a very nice day and a great weekend. Thank you.